Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of CEO and Market Expert Interviews. I'm your host, Lucian. Some of you know me as Triangle Investor from social medias. Today, I'm joined by John Fennec, a founder of Fennec Consulting, a familiar name when it comes to metals and mining sector. John, it is great to have you. Welcome. Thanks a lot for having me today. Uh, before we dive into the commodities and stocks, uh, I would like to hear your opinion on the general markets heading next. Uh, are we ending this 50 years bull market or there is some gas in the tank and we will see new all-time highs? So what's your take? Yeah, it's important to note that March of 09 was clearly the low um, and now we're 15 and a half years later. And, and I always encourage people as someone who's been in finance for 32 years, you need to check your statements for your 401k, your retirement money, your serious money, because I'm of the belief that, you know, people that are in mining stocks may have five to 15% of their net worth in, in our sector, right? I mean, I'm much heavier uh, than that, but I think most people aren't. So that you need to take care of that first, right? If you're in the EFA, the S&P, the NASDAQ, you need to start lightening up positions here. There's just too much risk. Uh, you saw the the second you know assassination attempt on Trump this weekend. Um, I mean, what happens if we have a black swan event? How do you how does your portfolio perform? I can tell you how it's going to perform. It's it's algorithmic buying and selling that will control your portfolio. So it's it's not in your hands anymore, right? And you're going to wish you took some some money off the table. So you know, look from September 18th tomorrow to November 5th, I think there's going to be a lot of volatility. And uh, we've got the BRICS meeting in there as well next month. So I think there's a lot of things to look for uh, as an investor and you know, be thankful for what you've earned. Agreed. Uh, when it comes to gold, uh, it is almost at uh, $2,600 and it seems like nothing stops this train. What is your take on gold going forward and are we going to finally see the end of the disconnect between gold price and gold equities? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, gold doesn't surprise me. Our target in January on many podcasts like this was 2500 for the year. So we're right at 2575 ish as we record. Another 1% gets us to 2600 a nice big round number. And, you know, we're, we're seeing a breakout here over the last, you know, few sessions. So very positive for gold. I, I think that this is some retail buying too. This isn't just central bank buying, right? Um, you've got a lot of billionaires uh, that have come out over the last two years and have really said, uh, really since the Russia, you know, situation February of 22, I, I believe, that they wanted to add gold to their portfolios or their funds. Um, and you're seeing it in, in prices, right? We held 1,900 many, many months last year on a closing basis. We're holding 2,300, the same thing right now for weeks and weeks. And now you're blasting off past 2,500. So gold's taking care of itself and doing what it should be doing in this environment. Gold equities, to your point, have been miserable um, outside of the producers, right? Like if you look at Agnico, which is one of our largest holdings, AEM, beautiful looking chart. I mean, who wouldn't want that chart, right? So like there are standouts, but Barrick hasn't performed, uh, although they had a really good quarter in July, uh, G-O-L-D. Um, and Newmont is starting to perk up uh, NEM. So there's hope, I think, on the producers. The developers and the explorers are where we're spending a lot of our time right now because they're still super undervalued. And that's where you have to spend your time as a value investor, right? I mean, sure, we'll hold Agnico, we'll hold Newmont, we'll hold GDX, the big ETF, but we're going to find some names. Like I just met with Nextgold, um, which is um, uh, a new play for us that Frank Juster got involved with um, when he merged his company with them earlier this year. And the stock is languishing um, given where they have uh, 3 million ounces plus of gold in the ground in Canada in a safe jurisdiction, right? So you look at stuff like that and say, what if they were to acquire other smaller players either around them or just in North America in general? They could get to production much faster than the market is expecting. Right now, you're probably looking at 2030, 2029, possibly for production. But what if they acquired something that was near-term production? Then, then the market would respond, I think, to that stock. And in talking to management, I mean, they're they're looking at all options. Uh, so, very intriguing story there. Um, you know, in in uh, drill results, Golden Caribou really impressed me about a week ago, and I met with them at Beaver Creek, and the CEO said to me, "Man, I'm really." 
disappointed that we didn't get a breakout on this news. I don't know what the market is looking for. And that is the sentiment of so many CEOs is that they're putting out good drill results and the market is, I wouldn't say fading them, but they're not giving them the love that they deserve yes. for those drill results, right? Because drilling is extremely risky. It's very expensive. Um, and in 2020, we saw these drill results get embraced, right? If you remember, Free Gold Ventures went from three cents to about a buck twenty US on the back of Eric Sprott recommending it two or three times. I mean, there was no real no barn burner news. I think their news now is much better than what it was then, but the stock went up exponentially. So I think something like Golden Caribou, uh, GCC in Canada, GCCFF in the States is worth a look here at 15 cents. I mean, it, it, it rallied to about 19 cents here uh, on the back of their news last week. And I think they'll have more drill results coming in more assays. And uh, Frank knows what he's doing. He's been in the business 25 years and came out of retirement for this project. Some other names, maybe what uh, some other gold equities you hold, or maybe some that you have on your radar, but not holding at the moment. So I've given your listeners some producers and some explorers uh, and a developer. So Next Gold would be a developer, Golden Caribou, an explorer. Another explorer that we just met with at Beaver is First Nordic, uh, FNMCF in the States, FNM in Canada. Um, the reason we met with them is that Taj Singh has you know, been in the business quite a while and, and led Discovery Silver, if you remember, that big deposit in Mexico to success and then pivoted away from Mexico. And now he's in Sweden, which we consider to be a reasonably good you know, jurisdiction. Um, and he's got 3 million ounces of gold there. So you can see a trend that we look for, either really good drill results or 3 million plus ounces of gold in the ground, because then you're going to get people like Agnico, which is a partner of theirs, much more interested in their project, right? Um, so, you know, I think that stock here at 25 us looks very attractive. It hit 33 to 35 us earlier this year. So I think a retracement back to that level isn't out of the question. Um, what else, uh, in gold? Yeah. I mean, B2 gold BTG had some great, uh, news in Mali a few days ago because that had really crushed the stock in January. Uh, it's rebounded quite a bit. Um, it's a holding in GDX and GDXJ typically, um, which always gives it some some more juice. Um, and uh, Clive Johnson won co-CEO of the year four years ago in the mining space. So, you know, that's one that we hold. We're not adding to that, to be frank. Um, we want to see them deliver. And uh, we like it because their AISC, their all-in sustaining cost is quite low versus the peer group. Okay. Uh, could the scenario of this disconnect we just talked about uh, happen to uranium? I mean, uh, uranium spot price is like going up. Uh, actually, we had, we, we had a pullback from, from 106 highs, but nevertheless, could the scenario of disconnect between spot price and the equities happen to uranium? Or do you believe that uranium is a different story? We really like uranium. Um both short and long-term. Um, the, the breakout last year we felt was real. Um, you know, I worked for Rick Rule at Sprott for a bit and Rick always told me when I was there, you know, you got to get into this stuff, but he had a different timeline than I did, right? I wanted to see a breakout before I get in. And that's why we got in more in the, you know, three years ago range as opposed to uh, eight years ago. So um, this is probably the subsector I know the least uh, of, of all your questions today, but I've done a lot of homework and I've met with a lot of CEOs and I feel very comfortable with some. Um, you know, URA is the ETF in the US that you can buy that would encompass NextGen, Denison, Cameco, et cetera, right? It's an easy way to play the sector. So we own some URA. Um, we just bought again Uranium Royalty, which is U-R-O-Y, which is a NASDAQ stock. Um, at two bucks. I mean, it's trading now at like 212, but it's a royalty company. You know, I mean, it's not, you know, going out there and taking exploration risks like so many of these companies are. So we don't understand the disconnect there. Um, I'm meeting with Scott Melby here in a few weeks, so I'll, I'll be able to give you an update the next time we meet, but um, super cheap. Um, I think uh, Forum Energy, uh, FDCFF in the States, FDC, or I believe, FMC. Yeah, yeah, FMC. You know, let's let's look at the facts, right? If you look at their breakout last September, 
we went on many podcasts in July and August of last year at four and five cents US and, and literally used the word this price this price is insane. It was it was just too low given the prospects for that company. Then they came out with a new discovery in the Thelon Basin and the stock went to 15 and a half US. They did a financing into strength. They cashed up. I mean, they, they raised $10 million, which for a junior in uranium is no small feat. And then they're drilling right now. So all the money they raised last year, you know, diluting us as shareholders, like so many juniors have to, is being put to good use right now on the ground. So, you know, if you don't own that one, you have to own some of it because, you know, that's what, you know, uranium exploration is about to me. You have to take some risk. And um, I think Rebecca Hunter is a great geo and, and Rick Mazur's the CEO and he's been in uranium for 40 years. So, um, you know, you look for good teams like that. And then another one I'll just give you before we move on is Peninsula Energy. I mean, I've been talking to Wayne. We're supposed to have a call October 2nd to talk more about his strategy for, for Q4. But uh, that's PENMF in the States, uh, PEN uh, elsewhere. And if you look at their news flow, they've raised a ton of money. They have a lot of shares out, yes, but they are going into production this year. So so many of the names uh, that are talked about on shows like yours are going into production many, many years from now, right? And so this is something in Wyoming um, where Lance is going into production within, you know, 90 days. So it's, it's very exciting. Um, and I think a stock like that at five cents could, you know, go up, you know, 50% by accident if they, if they do well, right? So the market, I think, is sort of fading some of these things and seeing if they can produce or, or come up with better results and, when you get too cute with your entry point on some of this stuff, you, you miss opportunities. Uh, great. Uh, any other names, uranium names, maybe on some on your radar? Same question, like gold, that you don't have them, but you are considering to add them. I mean, F3 has faded from 41 cents US in January, February to 18 and a half cents right now. And Everyone said they had a good discovery last year, right? So what's changed? Not much. And so that ticker is F-U-U-F-F. Um, I believe it's F-U-U in Canada. And so stuff like that, we track until we get to a like a, a, a low where we, we just can't resist buying. Um, you know, and, and I would say that you want to watch uranium spot price because like you said, you know, it, it, it had topped out somewhere around 105 to 109, somewhere in there. And then it basically has pulled back and it was holding support around 80 and it broke support recently. So that wasn't wonderful. And some of the juniors responded in kind. But, you know, again, um, there's a supply shortage and there's more interest in the space. People globally, meaning governments, realize they have to do something about this energy crisis that we're in. And I think uranium, you know, has turned the corner um, as early as last year. Yeah. Uh, before we move on the next uh, commodity, I would like to ask you one more question about uranium, and that is how would you explain the recent pullback in uranium equities? Do you consider that as a seasonality factor or is it a fear of broad market crash or something else? What's your take? Yeah, probably more the fear of a correction, because remember, uranium is not a protective asset like gold and silver. You want protection, you go to, to precious metals. You don't go to uranium or copper, in my opinion. You go to something like gold-related and silver-related because go back and look at the Russian you know, um, invasion in February of 2022. What popped? Well, palladium popped, um, gold popped, silver popped, you know, certain things that Russia you know, was involved with or the fear trade popped right for a good month plus. Um, I don't think uranium popped then. I have to go back and look at the chart, but I don't think that sector was popping because it's not considered a safe haven, you know? So look, I mean, I think it it deserves a place in a portfolio. It's just not a huge overweight for us right now. We're much more overweight gold. You know, we have 41% of our portfolio in gold stocks. 41% in gold stocks. 41. 41 okay. Yeah. Okay, uh, let's return to precious metals. I would like to hear your take on silver and how do you play silver? Do you prefer physical uh, equities? If yes, which ones? Give me some color on that, please. So I've been buying silver physical for 24 years. Um, I went to my financial advisor in year 2000. I was getting killed in tech stocks. And I said, you know, what can I buy to help my portfolio? And he said, go buy some silver coins. 
So um, I've been in silver for a long, long time. It's the most frustrating commodity out there, period, end of story. Um, but the good thing is, as we record this, we broke above $30 an ounce last week, which is major, major news. For those of you that don't understand you know, charting and, and the history of silver, you really need to pull up a 10 or 20 year chart and see that $30 silver was resistance for many, many years. In fact, it was 11 years. So we broke above 30 earlier this year. We tested around 32.50 and failed, went back to the 27s. Now we're at 30 plus again. We're going to retest that 32.50 level again. So if we're at, let's say, 30 and a half to go to 32 and a half, nice little gain right there. But the silver stocks will respond much, much more because I think silver equities are much more rabid than any other type of equity, maybe uranium, close second. But, um, you know, people really follow silver stocks and, and root for them. You know, if you look at Aftermath Silver, which is AAGFF uh, in the States, AAG in Canada, they came out with news today that Eric Sprott gave them another $5 million, right? I mean, this was based on their presentation at Beaver Creek last week. Eric literally called them up, you know, yesterday from what report I got from management and said, hey, we want to put more money in. That raises his stake now to 19.2%. I don't know too many juniors that Eric has nearly 20% of. I mean, he'll have 10% or maybe a 5% stake, but almost 20% is telling you something. This is a real company. Um, their news, February 29th, really diversifies the company. It basically said that they have 99.9% uh, .9 battery grade manganese. So, you know, now it's not just a silver and copper company anymore. It's now a silver manganese company, really. And copper is a distant third. So, you know, I, I think they've got a lot of ounces in the ground and, and that's the kind of company that, you know, um, at least 30 percent of the float is locked up. Michael Williams is a good leader. He's not going to sell that company for pennies on the dollar like so many of these guys have in the past few years. So uh, we think good things of that. Um, another uh, name in silver that we like um, that we've owned since 2016 is Silver Corp, uh, SVM. They're breaking out literally today. They're at 409 right now. Um, I think the stock can move higher still because I looked at the RSI, uh, the relative strength index right before we came on. It's still in the low 60s, you know, so it's got some more room to run. Um, but they've done some interesting things there too. You know, they they acquired Aventus um, a few months ago to really diversify themselves away from China. Um, and their all in sustaining cost is very, very low versus the Silver Peer Group. So, you know, we don't... We'll buy some things that have higher AISC because we see the potential, right? Um, one of those is is uh, Silver X, you know, AGXPF um, or AGX in Canada. We met with Jose last week at Beaver Creek, and he said, "Look, you know, we've done some things incorrectly. Like last year, we we over we overstepped a bit, but then in September, you know, literally twelve months ago, they they cut staff by fifty percent." I didn't see too many silver companies cutting staff by half last year at that time. And he was doing it to survive and, and get to a better place. Well, guess what? Now we're at a better place. That company is going to be fine. They're a small producer in Peru, but Jose lives in Peru. And he tells me that people really misunderstand the, the backdrop there. It's a country that has seen a lot of strife over the years and they've bounced back many, many times. So, I, you know, as a value investor, I look at a jurisdiction like that and say, this is worth the risk because Jose owns about 11 to 12 percent of the company. He's not one of these like life, lifestyle CEOs that, you know, owns one percent of the float and, you know, doesn't have a lot of skill in the game. He wants us to work. Yeah. Uh, John, could we see 40 plus dollar silver in the remainder of 2024? It's possible. I mean, you have to see what the Fed says tomorrow in terms of interest rate cuts and the direction of that, right? I mean, so we won't know until Powell speaks. But if Powell is dovish tomorrow, I would say yes. Yeah, I mean, because we have a lot of uncertainty coming up and that's possible. But really, we have to break 33 first and then 35. And then it's sort of like not a lot of resistance all the way to the, the all-time high of 50. Yeah, uh, we covered uranium, gold, silver, uh, but I would like to hear your opinion on copper and how do you play copper? Do you hold copper stocks? If yes, which ones? Yeah, so we got really heavy in the copper in 2020 when we started to see, you know, post-COVID, like these copper stocks started to break out, um, the larger ones first, like Freeport. 
And we got more interested in the juniors because so many of them, like like the uranium stocks right now in the junior space, are just sitting there, you know? And it's like unbelievable that you can buy these things with the spot price increasing in both subsectors, right? Um, so, you know, copper, just from a macro perspective, Morgan Stanley, which is the largest, you know, investment bank slash broker dealer in the world, just came out uh, a few weeks ago in July and said that they see, you know, 13,125 per metric ton on copper by December 31st. So this isn't something that we have to wait two to three years for, in their opinion. We're considerably lower than that right now. That would imply a test of probably five dollars again per pound, and if you get to five dollars again and break out above that level, I think with some more authority, that's really what the copper stock market needs. Um, we own some Faraday uh, CPPKF um, because you know they're an Arizona-based company, and we're right here in the states and in the, in the Western U.S. with them, and we know that this state is very, very supportive of copper companies, and so. Jurisdiction is really important to us. Um, I think Paul has proven himself in the mining space to be a good leader. You know, he, his last uh, company was a nice takeout for investors. So that stock, you know, trading at 53 US looks pretty attractive. I think it could go back to 60 to 70 easily. So, you know, you can kind of tell from what I'm saying here. I, I've, I've never said one bagger, three bagger, five bagger. I don't believe that most investors get three to five hundred percent returns. I could be wrong. I hope I'm wrong. But um, I just think that you need to hit some singles and doubles sometimes. And so that's to me is one of those stocks where you can see higher prices for copper that would translate to higher prices for Faraday. Um, and, you know, when you look past that, um, there's a polymetallic deposit I met with last year that would kind of encompass uh, gold, silver, copper. And I just met with them again uh, at Beaver Creek literally Thursday night. Um, and that's Denarius Metals. Uh, so they have some copper, but they also have gold and silver. And you know, poly polymetallic deposits are 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 nice because there's ways for you to pivot and and make money. And and I think when you look at their two opportunities right now, one's in Spain, one's in Colombia, they both have upside. Um, the thing that intrigued me about our meeting is that they they have a serious plan to go into production in you know both projects next year, which is ambitious. But when you look at Serafino's background, you know, he's been doing this a long, long time. Um, he was a, a, an executive at Aris that led Aris, um, which is ARMN, which is in Colombia, by the way, with Segovia and other deposits. And um, so he, he's familiar with Colombia. That, that jurisdiction is not something that's, un, un, you know, unknown to him, right? Um, and Spain is super safe. You know, I, I mean, I, I toured a mine in, in Portugal last year on the border of Spain there. It's, it's very, very safe. Very, they're very supportive of mining. So, you know, I think that stock, uh, which is DNRSF and uh, DMETs in Canada, um, deserves a look. Yeah, you made a good point on Faraday Copper. I hold them uh, also in my portfolio. I want to touch a bit on that story. What do you think? Uh, how far is that company from producing first or first copper ore? And do you believe actually that uh, the company will remain in this format or will be taken out in the process? What's your take? I don't know. I'm not looking at notes to let me know when production is expected, but if investors want to go to FaradayCopper.com and check their presentation deck, I'm sure it's right there. Um, most of these juniors, to be frank, are a couple of years away from producing, right? And I think this is true of them as well. However, being in Arizona with two large deposits um, and probably some other stuff in the pipeline, uh, you, you are a target at $5 plus copper. Absolutely. Um, we're not seeing that kind of M&A activity in Copper Juniors right now. We're seeing that mostly in gold stocks. I think that will continue. Gold Juniors are like, that's why we're buying so many of them with 3 million ounces right now. We're just, they're just, you know, place cards, placeholders for us to say at higher gold prices, the, the majors are going to have to pay up. They're just going to have to do it. And I'm hoping and coaching my junior CEOs that don't sell for a 15 to 20 percent premium i mean this is not what we're in your stock for right like we're not hoping for a 15 to 20 percent gain out of this on a takeover we want to see more of the the you know, cisco metals type deals recently with 50 plus percent gains coming out of a takeover you know, proposal right that's that's bullish 
Um, so I think we'll see a lot more M and A as we continue into next year if coal prices remain elevated. You're right about that. Uh, we touched on four commodities that you are bullish. Let's touch on the things that you are a little bit bearish. Or uh, what are you shorting at the moment, John? Uh, is there any commodity that you are bearish on right now? So I'm very supportive of our sector. We don't short our sector. That's literally in, in the footnotes of my my website. Um, I think it's disingenuous to go out there and partner with mining companies and then short them. It's it's ridiculous to me. Um, so I'm not short anything. If I were to short something over the last couple of years, it would have been lithium. Um, LIT, when you look at the ETF, terrible looking chart, right? Um, however, there are some lithium companies that might look attractive. And so we've been bottom fishing a few of those, um, but really not a lot. Like, I mean, it, it's, it's like we want to see a, a commodity bottom before we get more interested. I think platinum and palladium and nickel right now, the nickel slash PGM trade looks really, really interesting. Um, nickel was down 43% last year. That is unbelievable to even say um, because nickel is such an important metal globally. Why is that? Well, I think it's because Russia is funding their war effort with sales of these three metals to uh, you know uh, countries like China. And, and that dynamic will not last forever. So we've been bottom fishing a lot of nickel and platinum and palladium companies. Um, one that comes to mind is Stillwater. Uh, I just met with them three days ago at Beaver Creek. Uh, it's trading at seven and a half cents US. I mean, they're literally attached to a major in Montana. So when you look at that deposit, they've got two great geos. Um, they, they've put out good results. You know, 49% of their mix is in nickel. They have a good mix in platinum and palladium, but they also, you know, have gold within their product mix. Um, and they have, you know, rhodium and some other things that, are, you know, people are, are kind of overlooking, I think. So that one, to me, as a value investor, looks interesting. One of the momentum side that looks interesting that we also met with last week is Power Nickel. Um, that's PNPNF in the States, PNPN in Canada. Um, the reason there is that they've had some massive copper hits this year. Um, if you look at the chart in April, they had really good news on the copper side. I presented with Terry uh, Lynch, the CEO, at a conference at, um, I think it was April 30th. And you can see right after our presentation, we only had about 100 people there. But someone in that audience got behind the story and the stock just took off. Like, I mean, it was like literally um, lined up with our presentation. And then, good for him. He did a financing and a strength. He brought in more money from Rob McEwen, a billionaire. He brought in more money from um, from uh, Robert Friedland, who runs Ivanhoe and is, is uh, you know, well, well known in copper. Um, and so that to me is more of a nickel copper, you know, slash, uh, you know, gold PGM story now, maybe a third, a third, a third. We're going to get a better sense of their product mix as they do more you know research here in the coming months. But those copper hits were really outstanding. So. You know, at 42 cents US, this is something that, you know, looks like it could do much better as uh, next year advances because the world really needs clean North American nickel. And both of those companies, you know, can deliver that down the road. Okay, John, before I let you go, I'm hearing that you are co-hosting Commodities Global Expo Conference. Uh, it will be in Florida, Four Seasons in Port Lauderdale. Tell me more about this event, uh, who will be there and what is the format of that conference? Sure. So it's going to be October 20th through the 22nd um, at Four Seasons for Lauderdale, Florida. It's right on the beachfront. The hotel is two years old. Um, I went down and toured it myself. It's beautiful. I mean, I think a lot of people will enjoy themselves. We have a lot of CEOs as well as investors bringing their significant others or their families to spend a little extra time, which I think is great. We want to make it a networking type event where the first day is simply a happy hour and a formal dinner. Day two is going to be one-on-one -on -one meetings with CEOs, just like Beaver Creek. And then day three is going to be presentations from industry leaders. So I've got Don Direct presenting, who uh, teams up with me on my YouTube channel. Don does not speak publicly hardly ever, so he hasn't done anything like this in years. I've got uh, Steve Miller, uh, whose nickname is Slim, coming, who you know, has 50 years of technical knowledge on, on trading markets like ours, gold, silver, equities. Um, you know, these these two guys alone 
you know, could put a master class on and charge hundreds of dollars just for an hour, you know, so we're going to have 45 minute presentations from both of them um, alongside, you know, some really great coin dealers, like I'm sure, you know, Miles Franklin, um, Neptune will be there, you know, we'll, we'll have some great people to talk about, you know, the coin business, which I think is important right now. If you want to buy physical silver and you go to a local coin dealer, they're likely to, you know, charge you a 25 to 35% premium for that. You know, why not go to a bigger dealer like these guys that can help you get better pricing? And so we're always trying to help the investor. Um, we, we will have a good number of investors attending, but I would encourage people to go to our website as soon as you see this, because we're getting close to shutting it down. You know, at the Four Seasons, the costs are extremely high. This isn't at like the day's end. So it's 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 a lot of money. Um, so if you go to topshelf-partners.com and then just click attendee registration if you're an investor or company registration if you're if you're a company, you can fill out the form and we'll reply to you quickly. Okay, are you attending any other conferences that you are not co-hosting? Yeah, I'm the keynote, one of two keynote speakers at the Stockholm Conference, which is going to be at the Sheraton, September 25 and 26. Uh, that's called NordicFundsAndMinds.com. Um, Eric Strand and a few other PMs like myself will be there. Um, and then in November, I'm speaking at the Zurich Conference with Mark Faber and a bunch of other people. That's November 10th and 11th at the Park Hyatt in Zurich. Um, then I'll be in London to speak at a few dinners uh, around the one-to-one -one mining conference, the 14th and 15th. And uh, that wraps it up for me. I'm gonna probably go home and hang out with my daughter after that. <laughs> you should, it's a busy schedule. Uh, John Panic, thank you very much for coming to my show. It was a great chat and I hope to host you sometime soon again. Thank you very much. My pleasure, thanks for having me.